Welcome back to the Football Fitness Federation podcast. I'm delighted to be joined by James Malone. James, his name has come up a number of different times on previous episodes with quite a few guests, and you'll probably hear why in a second. But James is a senior lecturer in sports science at Liverpool Hope University. So, James, thanks for coming on, mate. Yeah, cheers, Ben. Thanks very much for having us on. No, it's great to get you on. Like I say, I've, a number of different guests have mentioned your name um, in a good way, I've got to say, all positive in previous episodes. So it's great to, to get you on. And we're going to dive into a few different areas, I know, on this podcast. And um, the listeners will get a sort of idea about where your name has come up in terms of the really, what you've got going on with uh, bases. But just to kick us off, do you want to just take us through a little bit of background uh, yeah, sure, mate. Yeah, I mean, firstly, yeah, hopefully people have said nice things about me or uh, a few emails will be flying around. But uh, yeah, so I mean, go back to the very start. I mean, as many people in sports science and football, I'm, I'm a failed footballer back in the day. So unfortunately, God blessed me with uh, the knees of a 60 year old. So it meant that my my blossoming career was cut short. But I think, uh, you know, when you, when you start working with professional players, you realise just how, how good they are on a day-to-day -day basis. And then you suddenly realise yourself, actually, I wasn't that, that good anyway. So anyway, went from that into obviously the sports science degrees, pretty standard as, as normal. Went to John Moores from the undergrad, uh, decided then to stay on for the master's in sports physiology. So for me, football was always the driver. Um, always wanted to work in football growing up and things like that. But I think as, as I've sort of progressed in my career, I think you kind of open your mind to different sports and areas as well. So particularly during my master's year, I was quite lucky. I was doing probably three to four different internships that year uh, alongside a part-time job in a pub. So I was working, God, seven days a week. And it was a bit of a crazy year. But as part of that, I was doing bits with, um, you know, um, different types of athletes. So working as part of the task programme at the uni, uh, work with Paralympians and things like that but then the main thing was also working at Everton so I managed to get a sort of a two or three day a week gig as a, an intern with Everton's first team so back then which was uh, well 2009 um, you know that was probably the first internship that they really had at the club and it certainly wasn't anything official it was just a case of rock up and there's a trackie and just just getting the mixer sort of thing so there was myself, uh, another lad, Glenn Lewis, who's working at Norwich still now, and we just kind of went and split the work between us. And yeah, it was a great experience just to kind of, again, see what it's like working day to day almost with uh, that sort of top level footballer, which really opened my eyes. And then from that kind of went into, you know, different opportunities came up and different things, wasn't quite sure what to do. And then out of the blue, kind of this, this gig came at Liverpool, which was a, a three-year funded PhD in the end. So again, that was a little bit lucky by chance because I was doing a bit of work for Barry Drust at the time, uh, just doing some basic stuff. I was working like clubs like Marine, you probably no one's heard of on the podcast, and uh, doing bits of heart rate monitoring there and little things for Barry. And, and through that, really, I got the opportunity at Liverpool. So kind of lucky in a sense there and, and did the three years there, which... Were, were interesting to say the least. It was kind of a transitional time at the club. You know, first first year I was there, there was uh, the manager got sacked in six months, Roy Hodgson. Um, the King came in, King Kenny came in, which is interesting as well. Uh, change of ownership, you know, the club nearly went bust. I don't know if you remember back in the day with those dodgy American owners. So, uh, you know, I'm trying to do my GPS reports and there's people shouting in the corridors and all sorts of chaos going on. So, you know, for a, for a full-time internship, it, it was pretty much had everything. But yeah, did did the three years there, which were fantastic. Three different managers in that time as well. Uh, and kind of came out of that looking for a job and uh, by chance again, got this gig at Catapult Sports, who had kind of done some work with previously. So kind of went a bit more to the, the murky world of sales and sports science. And uh, again, that was just... Bit of a crazy job, really. Uh, I think technically I was the first UK employee for the company um, because they were based in Australia and uh, it was only around that time, sort of 2013, where they'd start to come more into the UK market. So I think, yeah, I was the first employee, me and a guy called uh, Steve Oosteroff, who's an Australian guy. The, the first office we had was actually his flat down in London, which was um, above a curry house, if I remember rightly. So we, we had our first meeting in, in his flat and it was just stinking a non bread coming up from the ground floor and uh, 
yeah, he told me his grand plans for the for the company and stuff. And to be fair, if you look at Catapult now, you know, like for example, you see the rugby league at the weekend, and the, they've now got live GPS data on TV, and I think you've got about. 50 60 staff based in Leeds so you know even in that the last decade it's come a, a very long way but yeah for me back then my my job was to cover the whole of Europe as a sports scientist so I was flying out every single week from Manchester usually and uh, going to see different people which was fantastic to kind of you know network and, and, and meet people of different cultures and backgrounds and as can tell by my dodgy Scouse accent it was a bit of a challenge uh, communicating with people and uh, you know, getting your message across sometimes and certainly learned a lot of that sort of more of the soft skills uh, through that job. And then kind of 2016, there was a, a job came up at Hope, which um, I thought was kind of intended to go back into academia. Um, maybe, maybe not that young in my career because I was still in my 20s and probably came a bit sooner than, than I expected really, but kind of went for it getting a bit tired of flying around every week and living out of a suitcase as well, which uh, which is great the first few years you do it, but after a while it kind of drains your energy a little bit. So, um, so yeah, so I took the job there and about to go into my, I think, sixth academic year at Hope. Um, so kind of feel like I'm, I'm slowly turning into the old man in the department now. <laughs> and that's obviously one reason why your name might come up in previous episodes with um, possibly a few students knocking around that, that have appeared on the podcast, but also obviously you work with bases too. Um, but just before we go into that, I know it's something we're going to touch on is the, the sport and performance division um, at bases, something that you are involved with. So do you want to touch on that briefly now? And then we will go into a little bit more detail on what is going on at bases as well. Yeah, sure, mate. Uh, so I joined that sort of division uh, just just before the pandemic, really, which was was not great in a way because we literally went from right, let's all meet up to basically having Zoom calls the last eighteen months or so. Um, so yeah, there's myself, and then we've got quite a large group now. So there's uh, Ibi Akabat, who's our our chair of our group, and then we've got a few people who are kind of co-opted members. So we've got Laura Needham, who works the IS. Um, we've got Adam as well, who works at Irish Hockey. Um, and then we've got a few other people like Hayley, who's the membership rep. Um, i trying to think who else is there now. Josh as well, sorry, is the deputy chair. So we, we have got quite a big group. So our sort of remit is to try and push that division and, and really start to promote it widely. So I think going back years, you know, with bases, particularly in football, you know, from my experience going through, it wasn't really seen as a big thing um, with bases. I don't know about maybe others on the on the podcast, but it was kind of seen as more of a, a lab based organization, if you get me, um, yeah. a bit more physiology heavy. Whereas I think what we're trying to do now is, is bridge that gap a bit more where you've got the likes of your team sports practitioners who, you know, can get accredited, can do all these things and get CPD, but maybe trying to make it a lot more applied. Uh, not to say, what was done previously was bad. It was just that I think the guys we've got on our team now have been through that process and understand both the, you know, academic and and BC side of things, but also then actually worked at clubs and done that side as well. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really interesting. I've de- I think there's definitely a bit of trend of more people in in football. I'm talking about going through the accreditation process or what I've seen anyway um, recently. Um, but I was going to ask as well. In terms of trends, you're seeing a lot of people now coming out of full-time football and going into academia. Um, so what was the decision for you? What, why was that the path that you took? Yeah, I mean, I could tell you a bunch of answers, but probably my wife would tell you the, the real answer for it. <laughs> so I can actually be at home. Um, but no, I think, I think ultimately it comes down to quality of life, doesn't it? So for me, I, like I said, football's been my life. Wanted to be a player, wanted to work in football. But I think there came a point, yeah, you know, doing six or seven years of it, pretty intense. And like I say, was feeling quite burnt out and, and almost at a point where I was thinking, oh, can I do this for another 30, 40 years of my working career? So it's almost like balancing the scale, isn't it? Because you get the, you know, the great benefits of working in football and the experiences and the people you meet and, and all that, that comes with it. But then the other side is the fact you are working 60 hour weeks and weekends, evenings, and 
missing your best mate's wedding and all that sort of business, you know, it, and then it comes a point in every person's life where you're like, well, which one is, is outweighing the most? And for me, I was missing, yeah, having weekends and spending time with, with the missus and all that sort of stuff and my mates and that. Um, like I say, academia probably came a little bit earlier. I thought I'd maybe do it a bit, bit later in my 30s maybe, but ultimately now, you know, done it five or six years and I don't really look back, to be honest. It's been a great decision. Yeah, and it's um, no, it is really interesting. I think in terms of advice, because you're talking about burnout and, and talking about lifestyle, I think it's really important, isn't it, for people um, to, to think about and consider. And, and I know different ages of coaches and practitioners might influence what they do at certain times, younger coaches where you've not got so many commitments. It might work traveling and, and working all those hours and building that experience, obviously. Um, and I remember speaking to Ross Burberry about this and he had some, some great pointers as, as well on the podcast. But what would your advice be for people at clubs um, avoiding burnout by basically dealing with it and managing that side that comes from working all those hours and, and doing, doing that side? Yeah, I think ultimately, you know, football is never going to be a Monday to Friday, nine to five gig. You know, it, it, it's just not. But there are possibly ways in which you can minimise those influences or those things that can cause burnout. So I think back to my time at clubs and, you know, the actual job itself, uh, particularly first team, it's not too long a day, in all honesty. I mean, academy is a little bit different. There's a bit more going on. But, you know, typically a first team, you come in the morning, you have your breakfast, you have your scram. You know, you go and have a uh, training at half 10, whatever, a few hours, maybe a few top ups, whatever, after it or gym. Well, ultimately, you know, you have your lunch and then most of the work is done by sort of early afternoon. Um, and what you find, as we know, is that coaches will head off. They'll be on the golf course by about two, uh, most likely. And then the sports scientists are like, oh, God, part timers and, and trying to prove the worth a little bit. So then they'll stay till five or six. So, you know, I think back to those afternoons and what would we be doing? Well, not a heap really, you know, we'd be like going over reports, which probably didn't need to go over. We probably already had what we needed. Um, playing two touch footy in the Astro outside, <laughs> playing father side, which, you know, it was great fun and stuff, but, you know, that could have been time spent at home or, you know, seeing your mate, you know, so all these things. So I think for me, it's about maybe being able to say no a bit more as well to things, um, which is not easy when, Obviously, you first come in through where you have to say, you feel like you have to say yes to everything, but ultimately becoming a bit more selective in, in what you do and also about efficiency as well. I think that's probably the biggest thing I've learned over the years is just how to become more efficient with your work. You know, I think back to some of those GPS reports we used to do, and it'd take me about three, four hours just to do one team's data. Um, and this is obviously with old technology as well, but you know, the more you can streamline your process, your daily process in a club, it just makes you more efficient. So that obviously then frees up time and, and that should be spent then, you know, in your home life or with your partner or wherever, um, as opposed to then thinking, right, what more can I do now? Because there comes a threshold where actually the work you're putting in, the hours don't equate to, to you know, a great impact. Yeah. I suppose it's that balance between sort of perception of, you not just darting off early and taking shortcuts and stuff, isn't it? And then that productiveness as well, isn't it? And looking at your day and being somewhat critical about where you can be more effective and more productive. Like you said, that if there's times where you can uh, make more impact in less time, then surely that's the better option to go about it. But then it is, is are there cultures at clubs? And I'm not expecting you to answer this, but are there cultures at clubs where you're just expected to be there for a certain amount of time. And I suppose that's the battle, isn't it? Yeah, no, I do think recent years it's got a lot better, this the whole badge of honour thing. And I think mainly because it's been called out by people, mostly on Twitter, really, I guess. But um, yeah, I think back to obviously when I transitioned from football to academia, going from working, you know, six, seven days a week, evenings, everything to a normal job, wherever that might be. <laughs> and I was like doing the work and then I'd be almost like, right, what do we do next? And then they'd be saying, oh, now we just go for a cup of tea or now we just like, you're done. Like, and I'm like, oh, right, that's it. And I, part of me felt I should always be doing something or I should always be working or, you know, especially because I was doing a PhD full time as well. So it went from that to kind of normal and it, and it took, to be honest, it took me probably two, three years to kind of chill out and 
and actually just go to a, a sort of normal level of work. So I think there are obviously demands in football, but at the same time, you know, I don't like using the word being busy, but there are people who just feel as though they have to put extra hours in for not much benefit, really. Yeah. And how would you go about, this is just interesting to me, because I know people approach it in different ways, like managing or maybe looking at how productive you have been. Does it come back to maybe to-do lists or is what sort of strategy would you take on things? And this maybe crosses over into your role now as well, not just not just in full-time football. Yeah, I mean, everyone's different, right? So everyone's got different ways where they learn or, or the way they manage the workload. For me, I've got certain systems set up which which just helped me in my mind. Um, I must admit, I'm, I've got OCD, I reckon. I'm just like definitely uh, definitely on the spectrum somewhere. If you go into my office, there's not, not a thing out of place. I'm one of those people. But um, yeah, I think for me, like just simple things like, you know, your email systems or, um, you know, you like say your to-do list and things like that. You know, I learned a lot of the years off Barry Drust as well. You've probably heard of on this podcast, but, you know, he's got, he used to make his own, or he still does it now, like prints off his own daily to-do list template. I always remember, and he used to go to a printer's in Liverpool and get it done. I always remember just like joking with him at the time, like, oh, you, you know, you geek, like what's that all about? But then actually over time, I'm like, oh, it makes sense that. And yeah. for him, that was his way of like getting his daily stuff done. And for me, I've like said, got my own systems and it's just about, I think you just learn over the years to become more efficient uh, as you get more experienced as well. Yeah, no, it's interesting because like you said, it's, it, everyone's different, aren't they? Different personalities, different ways of working. But I do think it's interesting how people stay so productive. And I mean, you look at like the business world and different sports and things like that. And there's there's a lot of stuff out there, how people approach things, isn't it? And it's not to say that that's the way to do it, but it's definitely worth thinking about what works best for you. I've got to say, I'm I'm similar to you, like pretty, pretty OCD, pretty, um, yeah, I want to be in control of things and and work off and, and be productive. That's my big thing. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was mentoring. So talking from both sides, being a mentor and having someone uh, mentor you as well, because it's something that we have vaguely touched on on the podcast, but probably not gone into that much detail. So firstly, what what's your experiences of the benefits of having a mentor or a few mentors? Yeah, so, I mean, as I described before, really, I've been fortunate in, in the roles I've had leading up to the present day. So, you know, going back all the way to, say, early days at Everton, I had um, Steve Tashin and Dave Billows, who were there at the time, and they they really helped sort of take me and Glenn under the wing and showed them the ropes, like how to use GPS, how to do warm-ups and nutrition, whatever, you know, like all of that side of things. And, you know, from that, going into Liverpool, I had the likes of Darren Burgess and, and Jordan Milson, who's at Rangers now. So people like that, very much, you know, practitioner based and, and you learn the sort of like almost the hard skills from those guys. But then alongside that, having, I guess, a bit more of someone who's a bit more of like personal level. So, you know, when I was doing my sort of master's and even my undergrad, I, I was lucky to have Professor Don McLaren at John Moore's, uh, who, had, you know, he's retired now, but I still speak with regularly and, for me, he was always a great go-to person to, to just chat about general stuff. And, mm -hmm. and then from that, as I mentioned before, with Barry, Barry Drust, and, you know, again, he, he had to <laughs> drag me through my PhD, which <laughs> probably took it out of him as well. But, mm -hmm. um, but he was great in terms of not just the academic side, but again, that sort of personal side as well. So, you know, when we talk about mentors, it, it kind of is a bit like that. And I remember at Catapult, and there's a guy called Barry McNeil, who's... Um, used to be, well, one of the early guys that leads with Prozone back in the day. And I remember sort of working with Barry for a couple of years and really being impressed by him, the way he sort of conducted himself and, you know, he's very much a leader in sports business. And um, I always remember speaking to him and he said, oh, you know, I've got my own business coach and mentor. And, the, you know, here's a guy who basically built, helped build Prozone from the ground up and was doing the same at Catapult. And, I always thought, God, you know, if someone like him with 20 years experience has still got a mentor or a coach, um, why is it, you know, not good for us sort of thing? So that, you know, for me, opened my eyes a bit. And I think that's what it's about. It's about having either a single person who can maybe do both. So maybe they can teach you the hard skills, whether it's, I don't know, databasing or 
how to do stuff in the gym, um, but coupled alongside the personal stuff as well about growth development and, you know, not, all, not, it sounds a bit cheesy, all that, doesn't it? But it's more about, you know, somebody who can be reflective with you and somebody who actually listens. Um, and it might not, you know, you, you tend to think of people who've maybe got 20, 30 years experience who, who do that sort of thing, but just because you've got that amount of experience doesn't mean that you're a good listener or you're a good uh, teacher as well. Um, so yeah, I think a, a combination of those things are what, what makes a good mentor for people. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because it's, there's, it's very different, isn't it? Bet like between being good at what you do and then impacting someone else to, to sort of shine and develop in their role as well. Like, cause we might, we might have very good sort of technicians like that operate very well on a daily basis, but can they take someone and like you say, listen and actually be impactful with with what they're doing in terms of like skills or traits that you'd look out for in a mentor so if someone's now listening thinking well I don't really have that where do I start like trying to think about where I'm going to get this mentor from or a few people from what would you say are like some things to look out for yeah I think you know it's easy these days isn't it to add the name consultant or mentor to your title on link then isn't it something on Twitter and people buy into it and things. So obviously you tend to go from word of mouth, don't you? Because if somebody's done a good job on a certain individual or others, they, they'll tend to spread the word. So that's probably usually your first protocol, you know, speak to people who've maybe been through their process and their program. But also I think, you know, it comes down to are, are they a good person? You know, would you go for a pint with them and are they actually someone who you look forward to chatting to rather than thinking, oh, bloody hell, like, I'm, I'm going to get roasted here. But at the same time, not being your friend, but in a sense, a critical friend. So someone who's mm. going to be be honest with you as well, because sometimes we, especially in football, we, we do the day-to-day -day stuff. We get bogged down and we just get into our little routine. And sometimes it does take that independent person to come in, helicopter view and say, actually are you doing that that well or have you thought about this and it's not to go in and just bollock him or anything it's more just to you know get them thinking about it and that's where the growth comes when they start to reflect and think on on what they're doing yeah definitely no, that's a great point and then what about who should be a mentor then like in terms of the other side um we've spoke about experience doesn't necessarily give you what you need to make that impact with someone but if someone is in a position now where they feel like they could make that impact, like who, what, what sort of people are we looking for and what, what skills are we looking for from, from the mentor? Um, and then I suppose, how do they go about then trying to attract people? Um, yeah, I mean, we've got like the more formal route. So for example, like I do bits with bases where you, you're a supervised experience supervisor. So, you know, I've got a bunch of guys at the moment who work, you know, amongst the Premier League and, and the Championship who are going through that pathway. So that's more of a, I guess, a formal route where you go through the workshops and as long as you abide by the guidelines and that, then, like I say, pretty much most people who've got a bit of experience could do that. Um, you know, myself, personally, I, last year or so, probably bad timing in lockdown, but decided to go a bit more independent and do stuff outside of bases as well. So, um, you know, for me, I just set up, as you do, set up a website and, um, try to get the word out a little bit as well but ultimately it's just about like say that you're a good person do you feel as though it's something that you enjoy as well because that's the biggest thing for me is actually seeing others you know doing well whether it's a student or whether it's a fo football practitioner you know seeing them grow and develop if you get a buzz out of that then that's when mentoring's for you um mm. If it's the opposite, you hate people seeing people do well. It's probably not pro probably not the gig for you, is it? <laughs> no, that is that is a great point, though, because it gives you that drive, then, doesn't it? Like, if you are, you're going to do that extra to to really help people and help them succeed. And you mentioned there as well, like you, we're talking about different working with completely different experience levels, aren't we? You've got students, you've got people who've been in the game for a while. You just mentioned before, like, well, even when you've got years of experience, it doesn't mean that you don't have those mentor figures in your life you probably have more don't you like that you can pull up on and, and get that advice from don't you 
Yeah, and that's it. And it doesn't have to be, you know, sit in a psychologist chair, lie down and, and tell us about your life. You know, a lot of the time it's just let's grab a coffee or a beer and let's have a chat for an hour and, and chew the fat a bit. But, you know, a friend will just listen, but then, you know, a mentor or someone will then listen, but also give guidance. And, and that's what it's about, is that guided discovery without telling them exactly, you know, do this, this and this, because then you're just a follower. You need to yeah. kind of learn on, on your own to... Uh, to come to that conclusion of what you need to do. And a lot of it, especially when people are at clubs, it's that neutral view, like you said about before, sort of the helicopter view, isn't it? Where you're taking away like any sort of politics and you're looking at real facts, but you're also looking from that person's perspective or, or point of view as well, aren't you? You've got their best interests at heart when there's a lot of other stuff going on in the background as well. Yeah, so I mean, like, if we come back to my time at Liverpool, like I said, we had some fantastic practitioners there, and I've, I've just named two of those. There was a bunch more, and the good thing there was Barry was almost like independent, so he worked for the club but worked for the uni, but only sort of came in the club once every couple of weeks or so. Um, so when he did come in or when I used to visit him outside of the club, it, it was a bit more independent, so you felt you could open up a bit more. Yeah, because that's the one one thing I've noticed. Speaking to some practitioners, is they're almost not not scared, but they're if you particularly in the club setting or you you know you're speaking to your boss effectively, you yeah. know, because a lot of the time that your line manager will also probably be your mentor. So there's probably certain things you can't say to them. Whereas if you spoke to someone who's a bit more independent, you could probably get a bit more off your chest that way. So I find that that's really helped certain people uh, the last few years. Yeah, that phrase you used before, I think, is key, like being a, a critical friend and being honest as well. Like that's the stuff that has to come with it, isn't it? That you you can have those conversations because that's where you're going to get the most from it, isn't it? You, if you're holding stuff back and you're not you're not being honest, both from both sides, that's where you're not going to have that much of an impact. And it is more of a boss and I suppose employee sort of setup. Whereas the mentor is essentially you're both at the same you got both got the same goals, haven't you? You both wanting that person to progress and develop. Yeah, and that's it. But at the same time, it's got to be tangible as well. So, you know, particularly if you're going to be paying money or things like that outside of, of your work, you want to get some sort of return investment, don't you? So it's never it's never a short-term fix. You know, a mentorship is, mm -hmm. is a long-term process. But, you know, for example, the stuff I've done, I think you had Norbert on recently on, on the podcast and we've been doing a bit of the work the last year or so where at the start we kind of, you know, filled out a framework and things like the hard skills he wants to work on and, you know, different areas he felt he needed to improve on. Um, whilst also obviously doing the personal side as well. So for him, he's really developed his, for example, his data skills and data handling uh, to a point where he's now posting YouTube videos, I think I saw the other day, probably taking yeah. over from me now. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that, that's an example where you've got a framework, you, you're trying to achieve certain things, but in terms of, as well as a personal journey, for him, he's kind of progressed really well and, and he's a lot more aware of, of uh, you know, different things that go on working in football now. So, yeah, I think, I think something that's tangible is also important. And I suppose that's getting that starting point as well, isn't it? Both personally and professionally to say, right, what are the areas we're going to target? What are the areas we're going to work on? Because, again everyone's probably going to be a little bit different with that, aren't they? There might be some that need to develop the soft skill side of things, or there might be some people that need to get into the data and things. It, it just depends, doesn't it? I suppose, depending on the person and their experiences. Yeah. And the, and the problem now is there's just so much stuff, isn't there? On especially social media, like, yeah. especially like courses and CBD and all that, you know, it's so hard to single out, isn't it? And say, right, I want to do that one or this one's good. And again, that's where a mentor can help because they've probably either been through that pathway or know the people who run the courses. Yeah. So they can advise a bit better on, you know, if you're going to spend your money, because these things aren't cheap, um, these courses and that, spend it in the right things, in the right areas. Because sometimes I've noticed football practitioners, they're dead keen, you know, really keen um, to do well. But they don't quite know where to go with it. You know, they've got all this energy and they don't know where to apply it sometimes. So I think... Mm -hmm. Just on that little bit of guidance, you know, which areas to go into and that I think is quite useful. Yeah, definitely. And we'll move on to some of the, uh, we've touched on bases a little bit, but do you want to give us a little update on what's going on at the moment? Like what, what we're looking forward to um, over the next few weeks, months, what's the plans? 
Yeah, so we're, we're still a little bit tied up in a way. So last last I heard is we're probably not going to do face to face until next year still from the last conversations I had. So, you know, I think in the meantime, as we've done the last couple of years in the pandemic, we try and make stuff online and, you know, we've we've certainly got like webinars and things in, in the uh, the plans at the moment. So, yeah, I think I think until we get that face to face back, we're a little bit hindered. But that being said, you know, once next year comes and similar to what, you know, you guys do, Ben, with, with the football fitness stuff and having those meetups and that actual, you know, networking interaction, you know, that that's what it's all about. It's not just about, right, we'll do a workshop on speed or whatever. It's, right, let's have a pint afterwards or let's have a coffee and and get to know people, you know. And, and for me, that being a membership rep, that's that's my biggest driver now is to, get that network going. We've tried to try to do it online with things like Slack and that, and it's not quite took off. I think people have just had enough of online stuff, haven't they now, um, yeah. pretty much. But yeah, I think doing more of that stuff face-to-face, and then we've got a few sort of projects going on, particularly in terms of football, is around internships. Um, something that Ibi, who's the chair, is quite strong on is the fact that we've got all of these different programmes um, Different, different definitions, different names for internships, but unfortunately there is still examples where, you know, students or young practitioners are being exploited for, yeah. for work. So we've, we've just initially started some initial discussion, which will go out for consultation, trying to create better frameworks for how those positions are advertised and what are maybe the legal limits that you can have on things like hours a week or contact time. Uh, and also obviously things about pay as well. So for us, that's going to be quite a big project and something that's going to be hard for everyone to buy into. Um, but ultimately something that we feel is is necessary the way the, the industry is going at the moment. Yeah, hundred percent. That that sounds really good. And in terms of the accreditation, we've touched on it a few times with people on the podcast that have been through the process, but anyone that's unaware of the sort of process, like, can you, give a little overview of um, the structure? Yeah, so um, it's something like, say, people are probably aware of, but not fully aware of exactly what to do. So um, basically, there's there's two major ways you can become bases accredited. So if you're a young up-and-coming practitioner, usually someone who's either doing the master's or just recently finished the master's, you can start something called supervised experience. So with that, the way it works is you, you spend a minimum of two years, usually up to five years of doing this process to become accredited. So you're given a, or you choose a, a supervisor, so someone who's basically accredited supervision. And that person can be maybe someone at your club, for example, who you work with day to day, or someone like myself, who's maybe not there day to day, but you speak to, you know, a few times a month and, and guide you along that process a bit more externally. So through that, the idea is, again, there's 10 competencies that you have to work through in the framework. You know, you start off, you, you submit an initial profile, obviously usually it's quite far down. And then over those two to five years, however long it takes, you, you slowly build that up until you get to that end point where your supervisor and the team and your reviewer thinks that you're you know, competent in all the areas and are happy for you to go off and you're not going to kill anyone or anything like that. So <laughs> that's that's the ultimate goal by the end of that. Or if you're more of an experienced practitioner, maybe you've got, I don't know, eight to 10 years under your belt and you've just not got around to doing accreditation, you can do uh, the direct routes, which is the one personally I did myself, where you submit a portfolio with evidence uh, and a case study as well. And through that, you can then submit to the bases office and then the panel will review that, maybe provide some feedback. But ultimately, if you pass the, again, competencies that are linked to it, you can then become accredited that way as well. So, again, I think particularly the second one, it's one that people don't think about. It is a a little bit of work, to be honest, um, to do it. And, for example, Andy Gard, who's a mate of mine who works at US Soccer, recently had his accepted and he approached me initially to to get some advice on it because there's not really uh, too much out there on it to be honest it's kind of just one of those things um so if if there are people out there who are looking to do that you know either through myself or or someone else who's gone through the process you know certainly reach out and, and they can help you sort of get that done yeah perfect and where's the best place to sort of reach out to 
and, and get that process started? Is that on, online and social media or the website or? Yeah, so if it's the direct one, you can just download that um, off off the uh, Basis website, and you can get all the forms and things. For the the Basis SE one, there's two intakes a year, so there's one currently open at the moment for this month, and then there'll be one in spring as well. So you, you could only kind of join up in those time frames, but like I say, usually it coincides with uh, teams starting the new season, so. For example, you know, I had a, a lad who's uh, looking to join this year from a, from a championship club and he'll now fill out the forms. He's got me as the supervisor and you submit it. And then once it gets ticked off by the office, then you're good to go. And then that's it then. Perfect. No, well, that's brilliant. Hopefully that gives a bit of bit of insight into the process. And I'm, I'm sure there will be people out there that, that have been through it and know all about it. But hopefully there's a few that haven't and that has answered any questions that they've got as well. Um, we'll move on to some of the quick fire mate on the end of the podcast now and the first one I know you've mentioned a number of practitioners already that have probably had a big influence on on your career so far but are there any others that that sort of stand out for you or anyone in particular that you'd say right these are the 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 guys that have or girls that have had the biggest impact on what I do um, like you say, there's, there's been a, a lot over the years, and, and to be honest, there's, there's probably too many to name in a sense. But you know, from an academic perspective, I mentioned about Barry and, and about Don. Both of those are very experienced. You know, Don was, uh, you know, still is really one of the lead nutritionists in football, and, and pioneered a lot of stuff really. And the same with Barry and, and what he's done over the years. So I was very fortunate to learn both academically and the personal level from those two. Um, but like I say, in, in the jobs, you know, I've gone from very much football-based um, to almost a commercial company. And even like working commercial side, I'd actually recommend it. A lot of people don't think about it, especially graduates. You know, you kind of, you do want to work with your, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo's, Mo Salah's, whereas there's some very good jobs in the commercial sector and there's more and more now coming through. And, like I say, for me, working at Catapult, just getting around Europe and, you know, I was fortunate enough to go to the likes of, you know, Ajax and Dortmund and, mm. you know, Juventus, AC Milan, going into their training grounds, speaking to their fitness coaches, you know, you don't get that sort of experience working for a club um, because they won't let you in if you work for someone with a badge. <laughs> so, yeah, for me, it's just about, like, networking. Everyone hates that term, don't they, and, and all that. And the way I see it, it's just, like, like say before, would you go for a pint with them? Mm. You know, if you if you meet someone at a conference, I'm not going to go around stuffing business cards in your back pocket. But you know, if you're at the bar and we buy a pint and we get on, then that's all it takes sometimes to to grow your network, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think it's one of those, isn't it? That when you have conversations with people, it it always comes back to, oh yeah, I know James from his time at at Catapult, and you can like you say, you just spread yourself so much, don't you, across the whole if it is the football world or sport in general, like you can create so many different contacts. I think that's a bit, of, that's great advice for, um, well, practitioners of any age and experience really as well. Um, the next one I always ask about, um, in fact, I'm skipping one then. Your next one is what is your biggest strength as a practitioner? And by that, I mean, from your time in football, but also currently in your role now as well. Um, as a mentor, as a lecturer, like what, what's your biggest strength? Oh, God. Um, <laughs> none, I don't know. Um, I don't know, it probably comes back to what we said before about uh, efficiency, I guess, and organisation. I mean, that's probably something if you ask my colleagues in my current job where what's my strength is probably that really is, you know, just being on it to the point where, yeah, I probably do have a bit of OCD and a bit... <laughs> A bit over the top sometimes, but um, just get stuff done, isn't it? You know, for me, there's like it kind of frustrates me sometimes when people, you know, students in particular, when they go, yeah, yeah, I'll do that, and then leave it last minute, don't they? In, in the deadlines, and you you see the notification popped up three a.m. submitted the uh, the work just before <laughs> the deadline, and we've all done it down the years, but that, that's probably something I've learned is um, you know getting ahead. You know, when you've got quiet weeks, to get stuff done. When you've got busy weeks, you know, you you got to prioritize what's the most important to the least important and like I said before it comes with experience but I'd probably say that's that's my biggest strength is just trying to keep on top of things really and, and make sure uh, everyone's happy at the end of the day yeah 
And then I was the, the one I was going to jump to was I always ask about CPD. Um, and by this, I don't necessarily mean courses, things like that. But basically, where do you now do your your learning? Where do you do? Where do you see like your progression coming from? Yeah, I was going to say my best CBD is probably the two weeks in Malta I've just had in the summer, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I needed that. That's a, it's not a bad point, though, is it? Because like, when we've talked about that avoiding burnout and things like that, like that is probably a time. And, and the other thing was the whole lockdown period, wasn't it? The amount of people I spoke to that in that time, they were like, oh, well, I've reflected on what I do and all that. So I know sort of tongue in cheek that, but I think it's, it's not a bad point. Oh, that's it. Honestly, I just physically getting on a plane, going to a different country and, and trying to avoid getting sunburned for two weeks for me, you know, <laughs> that that was actually glorious. You know, it was uh, it just resets the mind. You know, I've come back and suddenly you're like, right, I'm back into action mode now. And yeah. beforehand, you know, I'd spent 18 months working at home in the same this same office, you know, and I was just I was at the point of like death. <laughs> I was just like needed to mm. needed to get a recharge really. So I'd, I'd probably say personal level, definitely going on all these good and um cbd wise yeah i mean i've got to say bases haven't i i've bigged it up now but there's like i say there's that much out there and there's still a lot of webinar stuff um to be honest without you know bigging you up too much as well but those sort of network meetings that that you hold things like that and you know i've haven't personally been to them myself but i've uh, know a few of my students who've been along and always said that they've been great to just kind of meet people um you know, it comes back to like when I was a young student and you'd, you'd actually meet the names of the authors of papers as if they were like yeah. celebrities or something. Yeah. And after a while, you realise they're just piss heads like you at the bar, basically. So, <laughs> you know, it, it's, yeah, for me, the networking side, like, don't get me wrong, workshops and that are good and things, but just get to know people and, and extending your network in the right way, I think, is, is what it's all about. Brilliant, mate. No, that's good. I, I hope we've got we've got some good stuff there. I think um, some important stuff as well for coaches, like I said, of all ages, experience levels around mentoring and the whole accreditation process. So uh, I tell everyone to go and obviously follow what bases are doing and keep an eye on what's going on because I know you've got some good stuff coming up. But just for yourself, James, as well, if people wanted to reach out or they just want to follow what you've got going on, where would you direct them? Is it Twitter? Where's the best place? Yeah, seems to be seems to be the way now, doesn't it? Twitter and things like that. Um, I'm I'm too old for all Snapchat and all that business. So uh, <laughs> yeah, just just send us a, a Twitter, a tweet, whatever you call it now, and uh, or obviously email as well. The emails on the the Hope Uni website as well. But um, like you say, if if I can help with accreditation stuff or you just want a general chat, you know, um, I'm always open to to discussions because as I say, sometimes you you don't know who to go to or who to speak to independently. And um, yeah, just, just feel free to reach out. Yeah. Perfect, mate. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I, I appreciate your time, James. So thanks a lot. Yeah. Cheers, Ben. Thanks for having me on, mate.